flesh has a way of thinking it's already arrived when it hasn't really. Sometimes we think we're something that we're not. And if you'll let the Spirit show you today, God will shine His light into your heart of hearts. And if He shows you that you're not quite what you thought you were, it's not because He's mad at you, it's because He wants to make you better. That means conviction. That means uh, hearing God encourage you or chastise you is a good thing. And uh, whenever a preacher says words like that, people start getting nervous. But it's not time to get nervous. It's time to get excited about where God's taking us. I believe He's taken us to dimensions of being one that we've never been to before. Uh, and what that looks like as you find out that you're not what you thought you were, so He could make you better than you thought, or better than you were, so we can all be better together. You and I. Together, you and I. If you think about it, what is the common culprit to uh, marriages falling apart? To city councils not being able to agree? To churches not being able to pull together? To uh, I remember when my son and I were involved with Boy Scouts. And we went to a meeting and we spent an hour, some guy all upset about what kind of ball they were using for dodgeball because he was afraid kids would get hurt. He, he didn't want a soccer ball because it was too hard. We need to get one of those bouncy balls and argue back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. So, you know, five grown people sitting around talking about which ball to use. And we didn't get anything done that night. Everybody left mad. In fact, eventually... Uh, we chose not to be involved in that because it would have taken uh, too much of our energy just to uh, just to, to have a, a positive experience there because their common culprits the lack of unity and uh, I, I'm not going to pick on us in New England because I I've been here long enough that I think I can start calling myself a New Englander. Uh, but I'm speaking to you because we're worried about New England. We're not worried about Californians and Montanans and North Dakotans and people like that. We're worried about us. And I recognize whether anybody else has this problem or not, one problem that's among us as a region is disunity. People just not being able to work together. I mean, let me be, let me be real honest with you right now. We've had times where uh, we've, we've even in this church, among the greatest of people, you tried to get together a quartet or a quintet, and nobody wants to agree on the parts. No, that's not just simple music skill. There's, there's a spirit behind that. And it's a spirit of individualism and, and, you know, I'll unify, but let's do it my way. And I'm not here just to bust that spirit. I'm here to point to you a better way. One Spirit. Everyone say one Spirit. We have one God. Right? And He lives in every one of us. And that gives us uh, an edge on the rest of the world. You and I have an edge that we can be one like no other group of people can be one. How does that happen? I decrease, He increases. One Spirit. Say one Spirit. There's nothing more beautiful than unity. You can even take it in a, in a very carnal sense. There's nothing more beautiful, and, and forgive me if I'm being carnal here, but I've seen ice skaters who skate in, in a pair. You know, maybe it's a, a man and a woman in the Olympics. And really, uh, there's nothing more graceful than to see two people move in unity like that. Or, or a horse and a rider just bouncing through the fields. And there's nothing more painful than to watch a horse and a rider who are not in unity. You know. But the unity of just a, a jockey on a, a racehorse, just, geez, you know, that, that jockey is going with the horse and the horse is going with the jockey. Unity. Nothing more beautiful than an orchestra where everything is in unity. And I, I've preached this sermon before, so let me just hit it and you can uh, swallow the whole sermon, just remembering back. But, 
a, an orchestra, everybody doing their part. Now, there's one guy up here leading everybody. Everybody in the crew has to decide to do it his way. Right? But everybody's got a great part to play and a great contribution to make. But when we don't know how to do it in unity, I don't mean unity uh, just because we have to, and I'll talk about that in just just a minute. I mean that we're, we're one in spirit, like we're together. Like we choose in our innermost being to be together. Like we come together in a service and we don't just clap because the worship leader said clap, but we're wanting the same thing. We're worshiping the same God. We're believing in the same harvest. We're wanting healing. We're wanting, we're on one another's team. We're one, on one another's side. And I believe God has gone a long way toward making us one spirit of one spirit. There's nothing more beautiful than Christians that cooperate with one another and with God. There's nothing uglier than Christians who all have a word from God and all have, you know, they may have spent three hours in prayer and they all may have a, had, had, have had a vision. Nothing uglier. Five or six people that all got the mind of God and it's a different mind. Nothing more beautiful than a group of people that come together and they don't talk about what songs to sing and what scriptures to read, but God just puts it all together. One spirit. Did you say one spirit again? Jesus climaxed his ministry. He's about to die. He's got one prayer to pray. What does he choose to pray for? Oneness. Would you turn to that prayer in John chapter 17? I think if there's anything that God wants, what he's been working up to, the reason he's been healing you of hurts, the reason he's been teaching you to forgive, the reason he's been trying you in the fire, the reason he's been changing your very nature, the reason that he's been doing absolutely everything he's been doing is because he's had one thing in mind, and that is to get us in one mind and in one accord. Because our harvest is so intricately tied to unity that you and I can't even understand it. Unity. John 17, verses 21 through 23. Jesus is praying. He prays first of all for his disciples, and then he tur turns his prayer toward everyone who would believe, which would be me and you. And he says, Neither pray I these for, for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. That's us. Everyone say, That's me. That they may all be one. What kind of one do you mean, Jesus? As thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. Why? That the world may believe that thou hast sent me. The world is not going to believe because you have a great revelation. The world is not going to believe because you're a great preacher. The world is not going to believe because you can quote the Bible backward and forward and you can prove your point. The world is going to start believing in this great God when they see people of different walks of life and the different colors who truly love one another. They don't act it. They don't fake it. They can work together. They, they can give. They can take unity. One spirit. If you don't believe that's powerful, you just look around and try to find a group of people that can work together like that. You just look around us. We've been together for many years. And it's tough among us. God has taken us there. Uh, I, I'm encouraging you. We're on our way. We're doing a good job. You're, do, you're running the race well. But uh, uh, God's not letting the flesh get by easy. We're not there yet. One Spirit. And the glory which thou gavest me I have given them that they may be one, everyone say one. one, even as we are one, even as Jesus and the Father were one, because the Father was in Jesus, everything the Father said, Jesus said, because we know God is one. In them, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in, everyone say it again, one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and thou hast loved them as thou hast loved me. You know, people come to our church services and we're thinking, boy, if we can have a church service like we did this morning, they'll, they'll believe. But you know what? A lot of times, uh, the worship doesn't really convince people. Sometimes it does, but sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes they just leave saying, well, that's strange. You know what'll convince them? 
When you're on the way home in the car and you have nothing to say bad about anything or anybody. You know what will convince them? Is when they say to you, well, I know that guy from back so-and-so. He's a real scoundrel. And you say, well, evidently God's done a work in his life because I find him to be a great man of God. I, I find him to be a real friend. He's got his hang-ups like you and I have our hang-ups, but he's a good man. One spirit. One spirit. I don't know. You want, uh, you want a two-cycle motorcycle to take everybody on a field trip in, or do you want a big air-conditioned coach bus? Well, motorcycle's cheaper. You're going to pay for that coach. What do we want? A real move of God? Or do we, do we want a little tingle? Do we want a few good preachers? Do we want a nice little choir, a nice little building? Do we want a, a nice move of God? Or do we want this harvest that we've been talking about? The nice move of God's cheaper. But I, I, I somehow think that God chose you and has put all this energy and put all of this working out of things into you because He knows that there's enough people right here in this room that hunger after this harvest, that are willing to pay the price, that are willing to shave a little here and sh ship up a little here and let them sand a little over here to be a one spirit. Would you be brave enough to pray that way with me this morning? Let's ask God. Thank you, Jesus, for your word. I pray that it would do its work now, that it would divide, that it would encourage, that it would inspire, that it would direct, that it would enlighten, that it, you, you would empower us through your word, Lord. You would continue to empower us like you said you desire to do, Lord. Put it into us for the weeks to come. Give us courage. Give us reason, Lord. Give us understanding. Give us inspiration. Give us purpose. Give us desire and give us one mind, Lord, that we might be together. Working together, you and I, us together, Lord. Working together to reach a lost world. Let it happen according to your will. We're willing to run this race. We're willing to keep the faith. We're willing to keep the course, Lord. We're willing. In Jesus' name, I trust that you will give us the strength. Amen. You may be seated. It is, to borrow a phrase, a priceless privilege that we should be called, chosen to be a child of God. It's better than being an American. You now, being an American is good. And people who don't enjoy America often so long for this kind of freedom that they'll swim the Rio Grande and get shot at. They'll get in boats knowing that some of them will die on the way over because uh, they, they have this longing. They realize it's a privilege to be an American. But you and I were born Americans. And until you take trips or see pictures and realize that the rest of the world doesn't live like we do, you don't often really understand the privilege you had just to be born here. It happens like this. I was born to a great family. I was born to great parents, godly parents. And the older I get, the more I recognize the qualities that were in them, the good qualities that were in them. And I remember crawling up in a cubby hole in our basement oftentimes and crying and being so mad at my mean parents, run, wanting to run away from home because they don't understand. They're always so hard on me and they don't, I'm, you know, crying crocodile tears saying, uh, you know, I, I, I have such mean parents and I have, you know, I, I was living in a great home. I, there was no abuse in my home. There was no alcohol or drugs in my home. There was no uh, perversion in my home. We didn't even have the, the, the uh, a TV or, even videos that you might uh, cross the line on. We, we didn't have any of that. And I was thinking that I had it rough. But it was a privilege to grow up in that home. And it's a privilege being Americans. We don't even have a clue how blessed we are. People would give their life to be where you and I are at in America. But you know what? Salvation... Being one with the King of kings and Lord of lords is, is a gift 
that just would blow your mind if, you, if you'd really stop and think about it. The God of all the universe who made everything, who one of these days is going to rule the universe and one of these days it's going to dawn on all mankind that He was in charge all along. He's come down and said, if you'll be one with me, you can join my kingdom now and you're going to rule with me forever and ever. Some of you may sit on thrones. Who, who knows? I, I don't know what, but I have this privilege to be a Christian. I have a privilege to join with Him in reaching a lost world. And sometimes I find myself in a cubby hole somewhere whining about my lot in life and about how hard it is to pray and about how I'm a little low on finances over here and why God has an answer to prayer over here. When I have this privilege, I get to be part of an eternal kingdom. Yeah, right. the rule of the universe. It's an awesome privilege to be one with Him, to be in one spirit with the King of kings and Lord of lords, for Him to dwell in my inner being blows my mind. Why do I ever get so cocky that sometimes I don't want to pray? That's my greatest privilege. I am shocked at my arrogance sometimes. I'm shocked at my flesh sometimes. How it could be so, so short-sighted and so carnally minded. Salvation is about me being a part of this great kingdom. Ruling with Him. It's the greatest thing in the universe. What, what God must be thinking sometimes when He looks down and He sees us complaining about the requirements of being kings and priests forever. We're complaining about the robes we have to wear. We're complaining about the, the walk we have to walk or the prayers we have to pray when there are people that are blowing their brains out because they don't have love or peace because they haven't tasted of what you've tasted. What a privilege to be one in spirit with God Almighty. What a privilege for the Holy Ghost to dwell in me. Holy Ghost isn't something I have to have to get to heaven. It's a privilege. It's God in His grace. Great grace saying, hey, I will come to you and because of Calvary, I'll forget your sins. I'll cover your sins and I'll come fellowship with you at the deepest level. I'll be your best friend. And we're, we so short-sightedly make all of our prayers about money and about Him making our life easy and about Him healing us with far better than healing, far better than money, far better than other people doing what you want them to do, far better than a bank account or an early retirement. It's this fellowship we have with the King who will rule forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. He loves you. We're one with Him. I mean, just think about it. What would people give to be part of Bill Gates' team? What would people give? What do people give to be a part of the Olympic team? They'll give, they'll give 14, 20 hours a day pumping weights, skating, practicing shots. What will people give just to be, I mean, what would, what would fans of Britney Spears do just to be a part of her backup crew? People sell their souls for things like that. And you and I, you and I have this awesome God who proves Himself. I, 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 you know, it blows my mind even when I think about us, us all. We're used to uh, maybe not moves of God quite like this every service. But you're used to feeling God. There's not a whole lot of people in this town that feel God like that. Yeah. And how easy my flesh can say, ah, got to get up Sunday when everybody else gets to sleep in. Hello? <laughs> ding, 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 ding. An appointment with the king? A place to come unload my weary... So, a, a place where healing happens, a place where it takes cancers away, and I'm complaining about having to go? Oh God, give us perspective. What a privilege it is to be one with you. What a privilege it is to be. I, I want to give him, I want to be willing to give him all. I, I, I'll give him my opinion. You know, if I like green carpet and God says yellow, I'll put yellow carpet in there. 
Huh? Right. Oh, did I strike too fast? <laughs> did I move into the real issue too fast? One with Him. If God chooses it, if God chooses to use somebody and they're in authority over me and they choose to do something a little different than I would choose to do something, I need to have a hunger to be a part of this team so much so that I say, I don't care. I, I, I would have done it this way. I'd rather do it this way. But God, I have this privilege. I want to be a part. I want to see this harvest. We're going to make it happen. And we're going to have to be one to make it happen. One like we've never been one before. Unified like we've never been unified before. One with God. And you know what? We don't even have a privilege how blessed we already are. But when we get in a place of oneness and God is able to do the kind of things that He's promised that He's going to do that blow our minds, you and I are going to have the privilege of being smack dab in the middle of that. So if I can speak to the flesh, probably the other guy next to you, Quit whining about the prayer times God's calling you to. Quit whining about the offerings, the sacrificial offerings He's challenging you to make. Quit whining about the adjustments you need to make in your life in order to fit with what God's doing through the body of Christ. Quit complaining about leadership. You're not running your prayer group quite the way you think it ought to be run. We've got to have a oneness of spirit. And that means you're going to have to give a little somewhere here and there. That means you're going to have to quit having your opinions sometimes. That means you're going to have to be humble sometimes. That means you're just going to have to shut up sometimes. And be one. One spirit. The, the perfect unity is a unity that is done by free will. Now let me just show you different kinds of unity. If you, if you were to walk, uh, years ago especially, but even now if you were to walk past uh, one of those orange vans, it's got a bunch of guys in orange jumpsuits out in the ditches cleaning up. It used to be that they were actually chained together. We call them a chain gang. Tell me, is that unity? Well, you're going to be three feet apart. You're going to swing that thing and blow your head off. They all do it. That's the kind of unity you like. Do we want services where God has to step in with His authority and say, start reading mail? We could have that kind of unity. I could learn to operate that way. I could start calling out your private sins. And all of you could come here thinking, oh, you, know, you could feel the flames of hell. I don't want to go there. Well, I'll stay away from there. That's a unity of coercion. I've tasted of that. I, don't, I think there's better. Then there's a kind of unity that comes because we have a common cause. You know, you'll see, for example, uh, the, the, the radical feminists and the uh, pro-life team and the homosexuals and all those guys, they'll be at all the same rallies all together rooting for the same cause. And they're all bound together by this common cause, which is maybe anti-establishment or anti-whatever. But you know what? If you were really to set some of those groups down together about some issues, they'd be at each other's throats. They're only sticking together to get their, their thing done. We could have a church like that. Unity because we have the same cause. Right? Right? I want to have, a, uh, or, or, or worse yet, unity because I get some benefit from it. I'm going to be faithful to leadership because I get to be a deacon. I'm going to be there at pre-service prayer because it's a requirement of school and ministry and I want my, my license. See what I mean? It's unity. I could have a crew at pre-service prayer because it, it's, it's something I've asked leadership to do. And, you know, if... if if we have to, if that's the only way we can get a prayer meeting together, I guess it's better than no prayer meeting at all. 
But I'm looking to something better. I'm looking to a unity of spirit. I think we're beyond that. I hope we're beyond that. I hope you're in, in pre-service prayer because you have the same mind because your desire is to see something happen in that service because you want God to move. Not because you're getting your license and you have to be there because your license depends on it. You see how unity is kind of cheapened by those kind of motives? Everyone say one spirit. And then, this is, this is a little better, alright? And we've tasted of this too. Then there's unity out of enthusiasm. Cause, uh, I remember a couple years ago when we must have had 50 services in a row with moves of God like we had this morning. You remember that? We, we could, we could come in and the worship leaders, the poor worship leaders, they couldn't even sermonize. They'd just get up and give a C sign and the service was gone. And everybody says, woo, woo, yeah, yeah, we're in unity. Because I'm happy, you're happy, I'm blessed, God's doing things in me, God's doing things in you, and we're going to have this great revival. And, and God began to show us what He wants to do in New England, and we all began to catch the picture, and our enthusiasm caused us to say, yeah, let's be unified, let's go together, all right, I'll do it, I'll do it, I, I want to be in a ministry, I'll come play for three hours. And our enthusiasm carried us to unity, and that's better than coercion, and that's better than, than just because we have a common cause. There's some there's some joy there and some vibrancy and some enthusiasm. And of all the unities I've talked about so far, I prefer that one. But guess what? Life isn't always so enthusiastic. And along comes the testing and the trying. And along comes the dividing of the soul and the spirit. And along comes God looking into who you really are. And along comes God to the very core issues that says, Okay, Skad, now I know you have some desires. Are you willing in your heart of hearts not, not to come along with me because you think if you come along, eventually you'll get your desires. But are you willing to come along with me and forget your desires? And it comes down to this. A unity of free will that says, God, I had some aspirations and I had some dreams, but I will lay aside all of those for the sake of this one spirit, this unified body of Christ that you're trying to build. Are you still with me? One spirit? One spirit? It's a spirit thing. It, it, that's why God has to flow like He did this morning in your spirit. Not in your emotions, not in your enthusiasm, but in your spirit. It's got to be down there in such a way that if, if today I said, uh, you all got here at 10 o'clock and I said, okay, brothers and sisters, thank you for being here, but we're not going to have service at 10. We're going to have service at 1. Because God just asked me to do that. Now we're getting a little bit too practical. I had lunch plans at one. Automatic oven's on, it won't shut off. Want a motorcycle or a coach? One spirit. I can taste it. So can my flesh. I want it. I know it's good. It's, it's my privilege to be a part of this local body. You know, it is my privilege to, to lead you. It's really a privilege. You suppose my flesh always counted a privilege? You know, you know what the privilege costs me? And I'm not complaining. I just only have me as a point of reference. I didn't choose to live in New England. I didn't choose to live in a 200-year-old house. That was the doors God opened up for me. I didn't say, I'd like to go to New England. I'd like to find me. Now, I had, I have to confess, I have from time to time uh, in the early years of our marriage said, I'd like to buy an old house and fix it up. <laughs> I think I was delirious at the time, but I did say that. And one of these days, I'll say I was glad we fixed it up. <laughs> but all the days in between? I didn't choose this occupation. I didn't choose my pay scale. You know what? 
And I'm not trying to be mean. I'm speaking to your flesh. I had, I had less choice in my salary than most of you do. Some of you feel like, well, I, I can't make very much money. But you can go, you can change jobs. So what do you want, Hanson? You want to be a preacher and have a position? Or you want to move of God? Stay in Texas. Just, just about to turn the easy road. We just, just got all over all the humps and had the finances all set in order. And God comes along, and what He really says is, "You really, you really want what you've been praying? Then I'll, I'll send you somewhere where you have to start all over in the finances, all over in buildings." I, I'm telling you that to tell you I'm not just yapping at you. One spirit. I want this. I'm willing to take a cut and pay today if that's what God says to do. Because I want this. I want it because He's put it in me. It's not my kingdom. I realize the more, the, the more I go into this, the less opinions I have. I'm speaking to your flesh. Most of you think being pastor lets you have all the opinions. But the higher you, lo- you move in leadership, the less choices you have. My schedule... Uh, you know, I can't just decide, uh, you know, I don't think I'll go to church tonight. Sunday morning, I can't. Uh, you know, last week I was sick. I was sick enough that I did stay home, and, and I appreciate everybody pitch in there. But, uh, you know, as a rule, I can't just get up on Sundays and say, do I feel good enough to go to church? And I can say, What a heavy load I carry as a pastor because I can't miss any of these services. And these other people go and they they can be carnal at times. Wait a minute. I have this privilege. I have this privilege to carry the ball. I have this privilege to inspire others. I have this privilege to live the life. I have this privilege to pray daily. I have this privilege to eat the Word of God daily. I have this privilege to lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And you know what? None of that comes cheap. And none of that comes because I just have this whim that I want to go do something. It's not my ministry. It's not a big flash in the pan. It's God doing something. And I have this privilege of finding His will and being one with Him. I I don't have... It wasn't my idea to have multiple services for outreach. My flesh wasn't too thrilled about that. Still isn't. But I'm thrilled about what God's doing. I'm ready to be one in spirit. I think we need to to let the Holy Spirit flow a little bit here. Would you just raise your hands and worship Him right now? God, we're going to break the back of the enemy. We're going to break the back of flesh. Your Spirit will overcome. You will give us authority over disunity. You will give us authority over flesh. You will give us authority over the lying voices that we hear, over the discouraging words that Satan speaks. doesn't matter if nobody in this region knows how to work together. The people of God will learn to work together. We will love one another and the whole world will know that we are your disciples by our love one toward another. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For the most part, it isn't my way. So don't think that you wish you could be pastor so you could do it your way. You know, you go into a a uh, prayer group and you think, boy, I wish I could be leader of this prayer group Then I could lead it any old way I, I like to. Well, if your prayer group leader is leading in any old way they like to, they're not doing their job. Their job is to lead God's way and that's a tough thing to do a lot of times. But it's worth it. You know, we're, we're right here. God is unifying us at a spirit level. I want you to understand this because some of you are struggling with things that you don't understand. And if you don't understand this, you're, you're going to miss your chance for God to do this in you. God wants to point it out to you not to make you feel bad about yourself, but so He can give you authority. We're conquering disunity at a core level. Everyone say one spirit. One spirit. Core. Spirit. It's not about me cooperating on the outside. It's about me cooperating on the inside. And I'm telling you, none of us None of us are totally cooperative on the inside yet, including myself. So uh, just relax. I'm in this with you. I'm learning this too. God, 
is sifting. Would you say sifting? That means some people are going to fall through the cracks, right? We keep thinking bigger, 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 and he keeps thinking more pure, more pure, more pure. He is sifting for people who will be unified by will. Not coercion. Not because I got up and slammed them around. Not because I called them in my office and set them down. Not because I told them I'm going to strip them down of all their leadership positions because they don't do something. But people that are unified in prayer by will, by choice. <clears throat> that means <clears throat> doing it somebody else's way sometimes. Unity. I'll give you an example. I don't think John will mind me sharing this. I've told him God's going to open doors for him. But that he needs to, when he's here like he is today, to be a part of this local assembly. It's not easy going and praying 50 people through the Holy Ghost and then come sitting through a group of people who's not in a harvest stage. It's not easy going to Torrington and having people run to the altar and people getting the Holy Ghost and all kinds of excitement and then come back and, and step in. But but I've told him that if if he doesn't, come to back together in unity, God will dry up those things. Now, he may make his own appointments, but God's going to dry up for Why? Because this unity is more important than his ministry. It's not about my ministry. It's not about your prayer group's ministry. It's not about your evangelistic outreach's ministry. It's about being one. It's about being his. And that, that, that's what equalizes. If you're not a deacon, if you're not an elder, you're just as important in this church as I am. Why? Because we're one spirit. We're one body. Could I have volunteers? How many of you would like to leave your arm here when you go home? No, part of my body. I want to keep that. Well, you got another arm. You got two legs. Would you rather lose a leg or an arm? Well, why even try to make that decision? You, you ever sit around as kids and ask yourself, would you rather be deaf or would you rather be blind? Or which would, you know, I'd rather be neither. I don't want this to be about just the prison ministry. It's not just about children's ministry. It's not just about praise ministry. It's not just about somebody who becomes a great speaker. It's not just about prayer ministry. It's about a body of Christ, one mind, one accord, going where God says to go, seeing God do awesome things. Because He's the head and we're the body. Being one with Him. Like schedule changes. Here's one for you. Boy, God set this up good. This week, uh, we were scheduled to have three outreach services. But I felt this morning to change that. And uh, I'd like us all to come only to the Saturday night service in Southbridge. But I don't know where we're going to meet in Southbridge. Because our regular meeting place is not available. So we may be able to meet at the conference center, or there's uh, a, an American Eagle Hall that we might be able to use, or it might be at the high rise. Um, and this isn't a test like if you show up, you're unified. But then again, it is. I didn't choose to. I feel like God prompted me. Brother Wiltshire is going to be our special speaker. I feel like that we all, we're learning how to do this and we're failing together. And you have to follow me when I fall down. Just follow the leader, right? When I fall down, we all fall down. One spirit. Guess what? I believe God's going to do some things this Saturday night if, you, if we'll work together in unity. It doesn't matter where we're at. It could be a strange place. So everybody remind yourselves right now, no Wednesday night, no Friday night, just Saturday night, and we don't know where. We'll turn your neighbor and tell them that. This kind of unity means preferring your brethren. This kind of unity means counting the cost and deciding to do it anyway. Looking at the cost of the building and realizing you're going to give up some opinions. You're going to give up, you know, sometimes you're going to have the talent and you're going to know you could do it better and you're going to keep your mouth shut and keep your place and be happy about it. Not, not keep your place because you're going to get slapped around if you don't keep your place. But keep your place because, uh, because of unity. Because you want this thing to work. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these other things will be added to you. I'd like for you to consider a few people. 
people who wanted the right thing and were, in a sense, unified, but were so far off, it was pathetic. Korah. Who was Korah? Korah was a leader, wasn't he? Did Korah want to go to the promised land? Oh, obviously he was around for, you know, several months there. Only problem? He didn't want to do it in unity. He had his way to get there. He saw the cloud. He saw the direction. He crossed the sea. He ate of the manna. He saw the mountain shake. He saw Moses go up into the, the, the cloud and everything like that. But he thought, well, he's some guru and everything, but I've got a better plan. Was he unified? No. Judas. Judas wanted the kingdom of God. Judas, Judas stuck it out through Jesus' bad times. Judas wanted... Obviously, he healed people. He cast out devils. Is that unity? No. Somewhere in his spirit, he still had his own agenda. And somewhere Jesus didn't quite fit in exactly. Yeah, he cast out devils. Yeah, he... he, he saw things no one else saw maybe. He slept right next to the Master and then he kissed Him and betrayed Him. I'm telling you, you don't know your own heart and you need to let God shine. You might have taught Sunday school for 25 years. You might be the best school ministry preacher we have. You might pray 14 hours a day and you're doing your own thing and you're no good to me and you're no good to God. You're no good to New England doing your own thing. I don't care if you're a firebrand. I don't care if you talk to angels. I don't care if you call fire down from heaven. If you can't get in one unity, in one spirit rather, with us in unity, then you're no good to this great harvest that's going to happen in New England. You're going to be a stumbling block. You're going to get people sidetracked. People are going to follow you because you're making a big noise over here. And you and you know what? God's going to use you to weed people out. And that's a scary thought. You see what I mean? We're dying. It's not about your visions. It's not about your gifts. It's not about your great speaking ability. It's about a, a sovereign move of God. It's about a God who wants to do His thing, His way, and His time for His people whenever He wants. And you don't have any say in it, and I don't have any say in it, except my privilege. And we go to Him every day, and we pray, and we give Him honor, and He actually lets us have an opinion that He runs the show, not you, and not me. One spirit, one spirit, his will be done. His will be done in earth as it is in heaven. His will be done. It's not about great personalities. Saul was a great personality. Saul wanted victory for Israel. Saul even wanted to make a sacrifice like he was supposed to make. He just didn't want to wait for the man of God to get there to do it. And so the kingdom was rent from him. God's made you some great promises, but I'll guarantee you, He'll yank the rug out from underneath you just as quick as He did Saul if you're not willing to do it His way. Right. One spirit. One spirit. Cain was willing to give a sacrifice. Cain was on time, evidently. Cain built an altar just like Abel did. Cain was willing to do what God wanted to do. Just one little thing. He wanted to do the vegetables instead of the meat. So what you're willing to pray? So what you're willing to lead a prayer group? If you're leading a prayer group, but you're not in spirit really behind and underneath what I am doing and what the rest of this body is doing, you're no good to that prayer group. Everyone say one spirit. One spirit. One spirit. I'm going to say that again. You can be the greatest deacon that we have. I mean, you can be the most charismatic. You can lead people. You can have people bouncing off the walls in your prayer group. But if you're not one in spirit with what we're doing here, there's going to be trouble in that group before long. I'm not on anybody's case. I'm painting the picture so clearly that you can't miss it. I'm, I'm painting the, the, uh, the stripes on the street so bright. The bright yellow stripes. So if you head that way, you know good and well where you're headed. I'm telling you, if you'll stay in the lines, we're going to see people filled by the dozens. We're going to see people healed by the dozens. And I see so many of you getting one in spirit. I heard Friday night, Bob Tremblay and Bob Savory both spoke. And, and the things they said, they were one in spirit. They were saying things I've never said, but I thought or felt. Why? Because we're one in spirit. I didn't prompt them. I didn't tell them what to preach. I didn't. They haven't even had their public speaking course yet. 
But they got the Spirit. They caught the Spirit. We'll work on delivery later. But if they can get the Spirit, if you and I can be in one Spirit, we can have all kinds of other flaws. But that one attitude of being together and doing it God's way, it'll carry us through thick and thin, through all kinds of problems. It'll surmount all kinds of obstacles. One in Spirit. Remember Gideon's army? Gideon started out with 32,000 people, right? They were all there for a common cause. We gotta beat these guys, you know. We gotta save ourselves. Okay, let's all gather around Gideon. 32,000 people. God looks at that army and says, I don't want people just around a cause. Tell everybody who's a scaredy cat, go home. 22,000 leave. Leaving 10,000 people there. Who does he have left? He has sifted. He has sifted out the people who are in it for the common cause, who are in Christianity because they'll get a bigger house, who are in Christian, or who are in the church because they get to sing, who are in the church because they, they were born here or they have lots of friends. He's not interested in that. Right. Let me say it this way. You and I, especially those of you that have been in the church for a good while, we're so used to hoping for growth that sometimes we so want people to come be a part that we're, we find ourselves begging them to be a part. That's not what God does. Jesus bounced on scene. He says, now I'm going to heal just about anybody. You don't have to be part of my church. But the reason I'm healing is to prove myself and, and people will begin to see. And you know what? I'm going to go to the mountains and I'm going to get in boats and cross and I'm going to get away from people. I'm going to run as fast as I can. I'm going to see how many people chase me. How did he get a church of 5, 10, 17,000 people? He knew what he had. And he didn't placate. And he didn't try to make people happy. And he didn't, he didn't soft pedal his message. He just had the real stuff. We're, we're going to be a church of love and compassion. But you know what? I'm not going to chase people. People who've been around the, the church for 20 years that want me to call them up and beg them to come to church, forget that business. If Calvary was not enough for them, forget my phone call. If it's not enough for, for them that God loves them, then I'm not going to put on some program to get them here. I'm not going to come to play practice for, for 10 weeks so they'll come watch me put on a beard and act like somebody I'm not. I'll speak right to your spirit. I'm not speaking to anybody in particular. If you want to sleep in instead of come being a part of what God's doing on a Sunday morning, I'll pray for you. I'll feel sad for, for you. But you know what? I'm not going to cry for you because you're some poor somebody or other. You have the same privilege of anybody else here. And if you, if it doesn't, if, if you don't value it enough to, to get out of bed and come be in God's house, then you, you just chose your path. I'm not being hard. I'm telling you, as Pentecostals, we, we, we so often just wanted to grow so bad that, that we want to just placate everybody and, and go pick them up. And we should pick them up. But you know, if they can get 40 miles away to a casino, whatever they want, then they can get to church if they want to get to church too. We need some hungry people. We need some people who value what we have. This is a powerful church. It's going somewhere. If you don't want to be a part of it, oh God help your soul. And hell is hot. But you know what? I'm not going to change the whole church because you're having a problem submitting. I'm going somewhere. I'm going to see this harvest. We're going to pray like we've never prayed before. We're going to unify like we've never unified before. We're going to see God do works like he's never done before. Because I'm with him. I'm with him. It's my privilege to be with him. It's your privilege to be with him. Hallelujah. If you're afraid, go home. But we're going to have harvest. We're going to overcome the enemy. We're going to bring down strongholds. We're going to fight devils. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And, and then he sifted again, didn't he? It wasn't enough just not to be afraid. But he wasn't just looking for people who were going to see this great victory. He was looking for people that didn't lap water as dogs. They had to act like a soldier. They wanted to, they, they had to care about this thing. They had to get down and, and drink and at the same time be looking for enemies. And anybody who was just in it for the ride, God said, kick them out too. I have a feeling in the last few years, God's been trying to sift. He's been trying to kick everybody out of this church he can. You know why? He's not me. He spilled his blood. What are you going to do?
There's careers you could pursue. You could be in personal relations somewhere and be a nice guy. You could go be in a club somewhere and have a lot of friends. This is a privilege. God's taken it somewhere. And He's going to do like He did for Gideon. You know, do you suppose all Gideon's men got in a circle and voted for trumpets and pitchers? A weapon of choice? Let's go take this many. I three hundred guys. Yeah, let's get let's get some pitchers and let's get some trumpets and let's get some candles, some lamps. That would be neat. Yeah. I'll guarantee you, if they didn't say it, they thought it. <laughs> what a dingbat! Throwing out midweek service, hopping all over the place in all kinds of evangelistic service. Doesn't even know where he's going this week. <laughs> Anybody with me? One spirit. God has promised us the unthinkable. He's promised us a revival like we, we can't imagine. He's told that it's not going to be told us it's not going to be work of our hands. We just haven't believed him. We've gone ahead thinking, Oh, I know God's going to do this thing, but I'm going to be the great singer in the crowd. I'm going to be caster out of devils and uh, and I preached Wednesday night, you need to be caster out of devils, but but this isn't being built on you. We're one body. We're one spirit. And it's because you survive the sifting that you will be strong, mighty warriors. I believe in you. I wouldn't preach to you this way if I didn't believe in you. If I didn't really believe what I was preaching, I'd be a fool to preach this. That's a good way to clean out a church. But I believe. I believe I'm going to see what I've said. I, others of you, you're, 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 you're preaching the same gospel. You're speaking the same faith. But we're realizing it's got to be one in spirit. And that means I have to be willing to do it God's way. What happens when people finally get together and do it God's way? Well, what happens when people just get together? Remember Babel? When all the people came together to build the tower? And God came down to the city that Genesis says, which the children of men build it. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do, and nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Why? Because they were one in spirit. Somebody was able to rally them around a the cause. Why do people go to the Patriots game why do they stand for five hours in line like I heard about one guy just to stand and watch a parade go by when the Patriots win the Super Bowl or whatever it was? Why? How can we get thousands of people in the stand to watch this game? They, by choice, will to be fans. It's worth it to them. One guy flew, was it in Florida? Somewhere, wherever the Super Bowl was. Uh, what's that? New Orleans? Somewhere down there. It cost him uh, like several thousand dollars for the plane ticket. Because, you know, you don't, I, I don't know if you know how far in advance uh, where the game's going to be, so you got to buy the most expensive tickets. Why would you do that? By choice. What do you value? Patriots? Of Jesus Christ. What do you value? Your relationship with people or your relationship with God? What do you value? Your career or your ministry? One spirit. He's sifting. And I think you're surviving. I hope someone say amen to make me think you're surviving at least. Remember the early church? And the day of Pentecost came, they were all in one accord, one place. One accord, one spirit. And there came a sound from heaven. God did His thing. A rushing mighty wind. And the Bible said, after all that happened, they that gladly received this word were baptized. And the same day they were added unto them 3,000 souls. That's the kind of harvest. You know, we haven't seen in the world the kind of harvest the Acts had. Brother Wright makes this point. Even Ethiopia hasn't seen it because everything that's happened in Ethiopia has been a planned meeting. This was a sovereign move of God with 3,000 people were filled with all of them. God gathered them. There was no nothing rented. There was no uh, flyers sent out. A sovereign move of God. Do we really believe that? What's going to have to happen? One mind and one a car. 
Yeah, we may advertise. We may do it whatever way we have to. But eventually, I'm looking for the time where where we're our biggest job is finding seats for the people who are looking for salvation. Are you with me? One spirit. That's going to take one spirit. It's going to take you dying to your ideas. You dying to your position. You design. You dying to your opinions. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, breaking of bread and prayers. And fear came upon all, on every soul. And many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things in common. One spirit. And praising God, they had favor with the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as to be saved. Let me make one more point this morning. We are one body. First Corinthians says, but now are they many members, yet one body. You know what? My hand always does what my brain tells it to do. Always. Now my brain may decide to give it a rest, or a massage, or some lotion. But my hand does what my brain tells it to do. And we're not going to change and we're not going to placate and we're not going to try to make flesh happy to build this harvest. We're going to find one spirit. We've, we've already seen. God's brought us this far. He's given you a lot of reasons to believe it's a hand of God. You're beyond that. I'm just telling you, there's a oneness of spirit that He's still trying to bring among us that we have never, ever, 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 ever tasted of. This group of people unified and working together like you've never worked together before. Would you stand? <clears throat> We've been unified <clears throat> by the fear of hell. We've been unified by the desire for harvest. We've been unified by enthusiasm. Now, let us be unified by the act of your free will. Which means God will probably give you every reason not to be happy about who you are, where you are in this church. Just to see. What's this about? God's not looking for a group of selfish, you know, half-hearted Christians to turn New England upside down. He's looking for some people who are willing to pay the price to have one spirit. I believe we're going to have 202 in 2002. And last week when I was sick, I got a couple cards at home. And one of them, I'll show you later in a couple weeks. But it, it said, we're believing with you for 202 by 2002. You know, I didn't, I didn't ask for that. But somehow someone's catching that one spirit. Some of you sent me a card. Some of the leadership sent me a card. And I read your notes several times because your spirit ministered to my spirit by what you said. Nothing more beautiful than that. Nothing more beautiful than, uh, I said it Wednesday night, our praise team, they get jacked all over the place. The schedule for this week is all out the window now because I just changed everything. They may not be playing piano when they thought they were going to play the piano. But, and they don't even get the, the luxury that you have of just uh, having to keep up with where the services are. Sometimes, sometimes they're required to be in the Thompson service and next week they need to be in the Southbridge service. But if we can do that without complaining, or resenting it in our spirit, then we've tasted of this unity. But if Sister Hanson's playing favorites and we don't like the way she does that and she doesn't run the sound system like we like blah, 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 blah. It's not good enough. Not for God's people. Not for you. Not for the people that God has invested what He's invested in in you. Children's ministry. It's got to be one spirit. Even cleaning the church. It may not come, probably won't come on a convenient week for you. The question is, is it worth it to you? 
Again, when we were in Boy Scouts, we went down to this club, uh, this sportsman's club, and they require their members to give like 40 hours a year in labor. Or they're kicked out. They don't come to him nicely and say, you know, we really want you to be a part. We really missed you in the club. It's like, you paid your 300 bucks, but you weren't here 40 hours. You're out of here, Sam. you got to get in perspective. This is better than a club. This is the body of Jesus Christ. This is, this is the army of the Lord that's going to take down strongholds in New England. This is a group of people that's going to help break the back of mistrust and division and disease and sickness and lust and perversion and, and, and all the things that abound this area. And I get to be a part of that. It's worth the work. It's worth the changing. It's worth giving up my opinion. It's worth pushing. It's worth, it's worth it. It's worth it to be one in spirit and let God out of his gate into this region. The harvest is going to come by prayer. It's going to come by everything that we built up to, but, but ultimately it's, it's going to become, it's going to come by oneness. Many, many people together flowing as one with God. I've described it before like this in a service. If there's one hose into the swimming pool, the, the pool fills up in many, many hours. But if 50 hoses are all turned wide open, it's going to fill up in a few hours. You come to service, and there's one or two of us that are unified with God, we'll have a move of God. But if 50 of us come together, and we're not pushing for this or that, and we don't have all these opinions, and we're not sitting there stubbornly saying, boy, I came here, and they're lucky I'm here because I don't like the way they sing those praise songs anyway, and I'm, it's not my personality, blah, 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 blah. Your, your spirit stinks. Why don't you go to Calvary and say that? Why don't you look up at the face of somebody who's heaving? The blood is dripping from his crown. Why don't you look at the side that's bleeding for you and say, it's too much trouble to sit through a slow song. I like fast songs. Why don't you go there and see how cheap your little opinion is? I'm talking unity. God's looking for people who see the clear picture here. We're not playing church here. We're saving souls from eternal damnation. We're saving people who are about to blow their brains out. We can't have these petty little arguments over whether we'll have pink paper or yellow paper or whether we're going to set the chairs in a circle or a straight line. we got to have unity. we got to have a desire. we got to know where we're going. we got to push over these stupid little things that will hinder what God is trying to do. I see harvest. I see victory. I see revival when our spirit are submitted to His Spirit. The enemies of unity are our pride and our stubbornness, our own opinions, our self-righteousness, our discouraging conversation. Oh, but if we can be of one mind and one accord, I hear the sound of a rushing mighty wind. I see God taking the meeting out by the thousands. I see people coming to Him. Give us one spirit even now, right God. Right now, God. Let those who will, let them taste of this unity right now. Let them taste what it's like to be one with you. To be unity with where you're going. To desire what you desire. To lay down and die to our own ideas. And go where you want us to go. In Jesus' name we press against flesh. In Jesus' name we take authority against self-righteousness. In Jesus' name, I take authority over pettiness and small thinking. We're looking for a harvest. We're looking for souls. We believe in an outpouring. We believe in the means of God. We are unprecedented in this region. Give us unity, God. Take us over this church. 